Sheriff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, there's Maureen and Dennis. Thank you all very much. You know, being back here and seeing all of you, I just wish one thing about George Washington. <laughs> he set so many precedents. Why didn't he set one that presidents would, the Capitol would henceforth be where the president lived? <laughs> Well, I thank all of you for being here, and I know the, the cause that brings you together, and I think it is doubly important, more important than it has ever been. Uh, next year, 82, that's an election year for all of our assemblymen, the administration for the Senate. And if I have my figures correct, we would only have to hold our own in the assembly where all are up for election and win 10 of their seats and we'd have a majority there. And in the Senate, we'd only have to, there are 14 of them up for re-election and only six Republicans and we'd only have to hold our own and win four and we would control that house. And then, of course, we want the administration also. And the reason it's doubly important is because of some of the things that have been going on in Washington. I am determined that we're going to do everything we can to restore federalism to this land, to make this once again a federation of sovereign states in which state governments, local governments, would have more autonomy than they've had for 50 years. And <laughs> while we didn't get all we wanted in the block grant process to take off the backs of state and local government, the red tape, and the regulations, the, uh, the strings that go with categorical grants, We'll keep on trying and fighting because my dream is that the block grants are only a means to an end. And the end would be when the federal government turns back to the states and local governments sources, actual tax sources of revenue, allowing the states and the local governments to perform those functions which are theirs by the Constitution and that they would have the tax resources with which to support those functions. Uh, The other day, the other day up in the fog uh, 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 on the hill, we signed those two bills, and I got so mad because I kept looking and looking. They wouldn't show enough of the size of them. The budget cuts alone were a stack of paper that high. I've read every page. Um, and the tax cuts were only that high. But even so, in those tax cuts, it's going to amount to hundreds of billions of dollars over the next few years. It's going to reverse a tax increase built into the system that was going to take $92 billion more out of your pockets next year and 300 and some billion dollars out of your pockets over the next three years. But the budget cuts, I think, have reversed a trend of the last half century. The idea that government can voluntarily reduce itself in size. And what we have actually done with those budget cuts is reduce the growth of government. Reduce it by more than half, from more than 14 percent, almost 16 percent, some say, in, depending on who's doing the figuring, down to six and a half percent increase uh, in the annual spending. And uh, we still have a job to do. That's only the beginning. Next year, uh, we, well, this fall, when we start in on the 1983 budget. We have to find tens of billions of dollars of additional cuts. And in 1980, 
Four, we're going to find more tens of billions of dollars of additional cuts. And then we're going to depend on those tax reductions that we've made to do what we've always said they would, and that is to stimulate the economy, to create employment, and to make everyone, even including the government, more prosperous because of the increased prosperity. Uh, Nancy signaling me that I should get, a, get away from here and uh, we could get down there for the little bit of time that we have. Uh, say hello to you. There are a couple of other things going on uh, at the national level also. Uh, one, of course, that's caused a lot of comment and uh, maybe I could seriously just say something. The air controllers strike in violation of the law and in violation of an oath taken individually by each member. And I've seen myself heralded as uh, setting out to union bust. I'm the first union president that ever got elected president of the United States. <laughs> but you know, some years ago, when public employees first started to unionize, Philip Murray, some of you here will remember that name. He was the head of the CI, CIO. And John L. Lewis of the United Mine Workers, Eleanor Roosevelt, said that yes, they could organize to bargain, but they could not strike against their fellow citizens. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said a strike by public employees would be insurrection against the people and the government of the United States. And we know what Cal Coolidge said. He says that if they go on strike, they're out of a job. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, I'm sorry. I'm sorry those people were misled. I'm sure they're nice people. But I don't think there was any choice but to do what we've done. Public employees cannot strike against the public. Well, there was, I just knew you'd be wondering what we've been doing back there. <laughs> well, God bless you all for being here and uh, make sure that we have the kind of a government in California in 1982 that'll be ready and willing to accept the responsibilities that heretofore have been usurped by the federal government. And we'll try to see that they've got the resources to, to make them work without all that administrative overhead. You know, the difference between local government and, and Washington is very simple. Recently, there was a little town. Their traffic signs were only five feet high, and they decided to raise them for better visibility for the motorists to raise them to seven feet of the ground. And the federal government came in and said they had a program that would do that for them. They lowered the pavement two feet. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Walter.